Hello there, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to the third in our series of Wild Isles webinars, Nature Reserves in Our Wild Isles. This webinar is an hour long, and it has talks and videos from my experts before giving you the chance to ask your questions in the Q&A. My name is Anna Feeney, and I work at the RSPV in the public relations team, which means I get to work with broadcast TV and radio, magazines, journalists, to try and get the word out about the amazing work done at the RSPV to help nature. Our speakers this afternoon are Steve Hughes from RSPB Ham Wall and Chris Hudson, sorry, Chris Hudson from RSPB Fen Drayton Lakes and Ooze Fen. Before we hear from our speakers, we have some important online housekeeping just to make you aware of. As this is a Zoom webinar, you won't be able to turn on your video or microphone, but you will be able to ask questions using the Q&A box, which you can find just at the bottom of your screen. We may not get time to answer all of your questions during the session, but we will try to get back to you at a future date if you haven't asked it anonymously. Um, but please don't feel like you have to wait until the end of the presentation to pop your questions in. Just pop them in as you think of them and put the name of the speaker who you'd like to answer it next to that and we'll get back to you at the end of the webinar. Just to note this webinar is being recorded and there will be a survey at the end which will pop up on your screens automatically once the webinar is ended. Uh, it would be really great to get your feedback on that. It really helps us to improve these and to see if there's anything we can do better. But of course, don't feel obliged to take part if you don't want to. If you do have any technical issues, there is someone from the events team on hand. Um, so she may be able to support, but for some Zoom related issues, we may not be able to offer any support. Now for our first speaker. Our first speaker is Steve, and he started volunteering with the RSPB in the mid-1990s and has been a full-time member of staff since the year 2000. He has worked on a number of projects and sites over that time, but has been based at Hamwall since 2005, first as a warden and then as site manager since 2008. Over to you, Steve. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Hope you're all keeping well. Uh, greetings from uh, a very bright and sunny Somerset um, and this afternoon I'm going to tell you a little bit about our Ham Wall Reserve. Uh, quite tricky to do in 15 minutes, uh, but this is going to be a very quick journey through the history of the reserve, uh, some of the work we do there uh, and the species that now live on it. Uh, but first things first, I suppose I should explain uh, whereabouts Ham Wall is. Uh, so Ham Wall is in the county of Somerset. Uh, it's about three miles west of the town of Glastonbury. Um, and the area that surrounds the reserve has its own um, very unique kind of history and character that make it a bit more distinct from the, the surrounding Somerset levels and moors. Um, and it's an area that um, in recent times has become known as the Avalon Marshes, li linking into all the sort of Arthurian legend and things that links uh, around Glastonbury. Um, and people always like to ask, so I'll answer the question for you. Uh, yes, you can hear the festival from the reserve sometimes, um, but it's on the other side of that hill, Glastonbury Tor. Um, um, from the reserve, so it's a little little way away. But when the wind's in the right direction, uh, you sometimes get a bit of music wafted over the reserve. Um, and if you're wondering where the name Ham Wall comes from, because it's quite an unusual name, uh, it comes from Old English uh, terms. So ham is an old term for pasture or meadow. And the Ham Wall uh, was probably a bank that was used to hold back water. So it would have been a, a pasture or meadow area next to some sort of bank that controlled water. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So for nearly 30 years now, the RSPB has been restoring the area known as Hamwall um, from old peat workings into a thriving wetland. And historically, peat was extracted uh, for horticulture um, in really, really large amounts from the area. It's a, it's a big part of the local culture and, and kind of history. Um, and this peat extraction process leaves behind uh, really, really large holes in the ground. Uh, the peat's extracted right the way down to the marine clays underneath, um, so it's sometimes up to over two metres in depth. Uh, and in the early days of this project, it was incredibly groundbreaking. I mean, nowadays, I think uh, as an organisation, we take this stuff for granted. It's quite a, uh, something we're very good at and we've got a lot of experience at. But back then, it was, it was a really a new thing. Um, a lot of it hadn't been attempted before, and, and it was a real learning process for us. Uh, we learned lots, lots of lessons along the way. Um, in the photo, you can see um, this is the first area of restorations. This would have been about, I guess, 1995. 
Um, and you can see the peat extraction going on all around it, where you've got those dark stripes of land, they extract the peat in strips. Um, and one important thing to mention is that we're not doing this alone. This isn't just the RSPB doing this in the area. A number of other organizations working alongside us doing similar things. So taking a really big landscape scale approach to habitat creation um, across a really, really big area. Um, next slide, please. So when peat's extracted, I so they take it right the way down to the clay underneath. So the, the area that we're um, inheriting after peat extraction um, basically looks a little bit like the surface of the moon. It's kind of like a gray desert. So we're starting from what's basically an ex-industrial site. Um, and over time, the reed bed has been created in roughly sort of 20 hectare blocks. Um, and there's all some really significant engineering works, um, moving this clay around to build banks to hold water in, uh, putting in structures to help us control the water levels, um, building islands and features so that a reed bed can establish. Um, and the majority of the reeds on site, believe it or not, were being grown by our volunteers uh, from seed gathered locally uh, and then grown in polytunnels from little seedlings planted out for a year um, and then taken out onto, onto the reed bed and planted into the, into the reed bed structure to, to try and build the, the, or try and grow the reed bed more quickly. Uh, over the course of the project, this volunteer team, we've done a miraculous job, uh, literally planted tens of thousands of reed seedlings in the reed to give us the, uh, the, the reed bed that we have today. Um, so all this work um, over the last nearly 30 years has given us a reserve today that's now over 260 hectares in size. So from that initial sort of 20 hectare block, it's grown hugely. Uh, it has about 18 different hydrological units. So uh, we have different areas that we can control the water differently in. Um, gives us a lot more control than some of the more natural reed beds that are around. Um, and the habitat's really matured, and we now have uh, a huge area of reed bed, um, some areas of grassland and wet woodland, and it's maturing into quite a diverse um, and, and really, really good quality habitat. Um, and despite being man-made and heavily engineered um, from the ground, it appears very natural, uh, and some people really struggle to, to understand that it wasn't there 30 years ago. Um, we do get the odd complaint that when we do management work and things on the reserve that uh, we're messing with something that's been there for you know hundreds and hundreds of years and we have to explain to people well no actually this is this kind of story behind the reserve so along with our partners we include natural england and somerset wildlife trust and the hawk and owl trust so there's a big partnership of organizations working together uh, we now have over a thousand hectares of wetland that's been created across the avalon marshes so it's a massive uh, landscape scale uh, conservation project. So you're probably asking yourself, well, what, why are we doing all this work? Um, so Hamwall was, was a site that was identified as uh, somewhere that we could do work for Bitten. And that's been the main driver uh, behind the, the development of Hamwall uh, and our involvement there. Um, so if you don't know anything about bitterns, so the bittern is a, a kind of stocky brown heron uh, with kind of stumpier legs than, than most other heron species. Um, and it absolutely loves reed beds. It's primarily a reed bed bird. Um, and in the 1990s, bitten numbers had dropped to just 11 booming male birds in the UK. Um, and the boom, or the booming male, the, the boom is the sound that uh, the male bird makes during the breeding season when he's trying to attract females and, and, and uh, kind of display on a territory. Um, and it sounds a bit like somebody blowing over the top of a, a huge milk bottle. And it's an incredibly low frequency sound. Um, and it travels huge distances. Um, during the first lockdown, um, I live about two kilometers from Hamwall and I could hear bittens booming from my back garden. Uh, that's how far the low frequency sound uh, carries, quite amazing. Um, and the booming male uh, is the main way we survey bitten populations because they're very secretive birds uh, and we can assess how they're doing by counting the number of males. Um, so during, during the early days of, of, of the kind of bitten recovery program, uh, there was a lot of extensive research that was carried out uh, into what conditions bitterns needed to be successful. Um, 
and that was used to help design the habitat that we have at Ham Wall. So it was very much led by the, the research that was carried out and that fed into the design. Um, and we hopefully were ending up with a site which would really provide a, a great habitat for them and we could get them to start breeding uh, in Somerset. Uh, we also introduced fish to the site to provide food for them. Uh, and as the reed established, water levels and reed bed were managed to provide perfect conditions. But despite all the effort and the years of graft, um, bittens were kind of reluctant really to, to make the move over to Somerset. Um, it took them a long time to find the site and finally settle down and start breeding. Um, we had a few false starts along the way where male birds would turn up in the spring, start to boom for a little bit, um, and then uh, would sort of just disappear off, really. They didn't find a mate or they weren't in good enough condition to carry on. Um, and we were all very disappointed and we were starting to lose heart. Um, but then in 2008, things really started, started to change in a really positive way. So in 2008, we had two calling males at the reserve. Um, so so uh, we were all quite excited and a lot of, lot of effort from volunteers uh, trying, to, um, trying to work out what was going on, really. Um, so over a long period of time, a lot of work, we worked out that we had these two calling males. Uh, one was a really, really strong booming bird. So you could hear him from miles away, um, exactly what sort of textbook uh, bitten calling. And the other one that we had was a lot weaker calling and he sounded like a really sort of wheezy old church organ. Um, but a lot of work went into to working out what they were up to. Um, and eventually we managed to identify two uh, bitten nests at the site. Uh, and both those nests then went on to um, fledge young. So this was a, a fantastic result. You know, all the work that had gone on for, for so many years trying to, trying to bring these birds to Somerset uh, finally paid off. And since then, it's gone better, frankly, than I think anybody could have imagined. So we've gone from two booming males in 2008 uh, to 20 booming males at Hamwall last year. Um, and across the wider uh, Avila Marshes and Somerset, all our partner organisations are doing similar work. We now have a population of about 40 booming males uh, each year. You consider there are only 11 in the UK in the 1990s. That's, that's an incredible um achievement really kind of turning this the population around um and playing our part in bitten recovery across the uk um and across the uk i think we're over 200 booming males now so it's, it's been a really good uh, success story built on that really good research and then delivering uh, what that research told us to do on, on the ground um so now we've got this enormous reed bed uh, and all this fantastic habitat we need to try and keep it in in really good nick um, and historically, we, we did sort of uh, reed bed management on quite a small scale. We'd go out with a brush cutter uh, or a pedestrian mower uh, and we'd cut areas of reed and then break them off and maybe burn the reed or, or try and dispose of it in some way. Um, and we weren't really having the impact on, on the reed bed that we thought we should. Uh, so at Hamwell, we've really tried to, to increase how we do things and we've mechanized a lot more. Uh, over recent years, um, we've got some quite large or relatively large machinery now that's very light on its feet, enables us to get out into the wetland uh, and do the work and not sink. Uh, we aim to cut about 10 hectares of reed a year at Hamwall. Um, so we, we have this uh, machine called a soft track and our assistant warden gets locked in the soft track most of the winter. He's not allowed out um, and he just goes out into the reed bed and cuts and cuts and cuts. Um, and all of the cut material that he, he generates then goes into a project uh, where we take all that cut material and we turn it into a soil conditioner. So uh, it's a peat-free soil conditioner and we then sell that at the reserve. So we're you turning our waste products into something um, that you can then go and put on your garden. Um, in the picture you can see um, we've got quite a lot of islands at Hamwall. Uh, one of the way, and they're, they're great for wildlife, but they're a bit of a pain to manage. Um, and we've actually got a floating pontoon bridge uh, that we, we bring onto site and then uh, we drive our machine over the floating pontoon bridge uh, to be able to access the islands. Uh, the team took quite a lot of convincing the first time we did this, but once they got the hang of it, um, it became the thing we do every year. Um, but yeah, slightly hair raising the first time. Okay, so the, the habitat we've created and, and managed with primarily bitten in mind has had a, a huge kind of impact for lots of other species as well. And we get lots of kind of 
common are reed bed species and we get things like marsh harrier and bearded tit um, and it's 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 really kind of matured as time's gone on um, but we've also got some species that we didn't expect uh, when we set up ham wall and one of those is the great white egret um, and these started breeding on uh, the natural england site next door to us shepherd keith back in 2012 um, and again a bit like bitten they've gone through an enormous population expansion uh, in the Avalon marshes. Uh, there were two nests again in, in, in uh, 2012. Um, last year, um, sorry, they went up to uh, 43 nests across the whole of the Avalon marshes. Uh, 35 of these nests were successful and they fledged 67 young. So the population of great white egrets is, is uh, it's really grown very rapidly here. Uh, as a new colonizing species and we've got some uh, kind of innovative ways of managing or um, surveying uh, the great white egret population so we, we've got some very good volunteers who we've trained up to fly drone um, and they are able to go out and try and monitor what's happening with the population of great white egrets and this is one of the photos this is from uh, not from Hamble this is from one of the other sites in the Avalon marshes um, and the cameras are so good on these these drones nowadays that you can actually count individual chicks in nests. Um, so that's a really big colony there. Um, so we've also started on the back of, of being able to, to identify nests and count chicks and know where they're at in terms of their development. We've started a ringing program um, and we've been going in so that nests are accessible and then ringing the chicks. And that's been able to give us a really good idea of how these birds are spreading out across across the the country after they've fledged and the, what the kind of behavior is of one of these species that's new to colonize in the uk uh, there were 14 chicks um ringed last year so uh, if you're out and about bird watching somewhere and you see a great white egret worth checking its legs to see whether it's got any uh, uh any rings on it Okay, so uh, alongside great white egrets, we've had a number of other other sort of new colonizing species that have turned up at the reserve. So the, the bird on the left, uh, sort of gray and black one, uh, that's a uh, little bitten. And they've been, um, yeah, it's probably 2010, I think they first bred at Hamwall. Um, and they've been kind of present most years since, incredibly secretive. We can't be 100% sure what they're they're getting up to um most years but uh yeah certainly present in the breeding season so we suspect that they're up to something um and yeah a really fantastic looking bird if you get to see it but yeah you need to put some hours in or be very very lucky uh, and the bird on the right is cattle egret which um again another species that's that's kind of coming more common uh bred at ham wall a few years ago um breeding elsewhere on the Somerset levels and certainly in the winter months they're a really common sight now um, at one stage there are up to 400 birds uh, knocking around on the Somerset levels and moors. Uh, we also get night heron um, as well which are thought to have bred in the area um, but they're very very difficult to track down. Next slide please thank you. Um, okay so kind of asked the question well what's coming next? Um, we do have some glossy ibis who are kind of um, been present most of the time for the last few years, disappear for a little bit and come back. Um, are these going to be the next species that colonize? We'll wait and see. I mean, you know, other things like purple heron or pendulum tip, perhaps. But due to the, the quality and the extent of the habitat that we're creating here, I think it's just an ideal foothold for, for these species to, to come in and kind of colonize the UK. Um, but suppose there was a bit of a note of caution with this. I mean, while it's great we're getting these new species and it's really exciting to see them, uh, we should remember that a lot of this has been driven by climate change um, and the, the range of the species are changing in reaction to it. So, um, yeah, there's a bit of a footnote there that we need to keep in the back of our minds, I think. Right, so uh, we do have some really, really good spectacles as well, apart from all the other stuff. Um, if you come to, to Ham Wall in the winter months, uh, we get a really big starling roost um, somewhere, well, depends who you talk to, uh, anywhere between a couple of hundred thousand to several million. Um, I'm never 100% sure who's right on that one. They're quite difficult to count when they're in those kind of numbers. Um, and it's an absolutely amazing thing to see. It's brilliant. Uh, it's a brilliant thing that attracts loads of people. It's on lots of people's bucket lists. 
um, that can get incredibly popular with people. Um, so our visitor team on some evenings can can deal with or welcome about um, a thousand people who arrive in two hours to see the see the murmuration. Um, so yeah, very very popular, great thing to engage people with, and a brilliant thing to see. Uh, this photo is actually taken in the morning. Uh, when most people come in the evenings to see the birds come into roost, um, I think one of the best experiences you can have is come out at dawn and watch the birds leave where they go off in one or two huge waves and just fill the sky. Uh, the noise from all the wings is, is yeah, it's an amazing experience to be out at dawn doing that. Um, so if you're thinking of doing the starling roost, don't forget to do the dawn thing as well as the evening one. Um, and yeah, as featured on the last episode of Wild Isles in the summer months, we also get this phenomenon, which is a four spot chaser dragonfly roost. Um, some days you can have up to 2000 uh, roosting dragonflies first thing in the morning in the reeds. Uh, really popular with photographers um, and, and visitors. Um, they just warm up really slowly in the morning and then they're, they're off, off on the wing as soon as they're, they're warm enough to be able to leave the roost. But yeah, really unusual behaviour. Not sure where else it goes on in the UK. Um, but uh, yeah, phenomenal thing. Um, and as, as mentioned on the Wild Isles as well, yeah, obviously that's got great food for hobbies. And we're, we're a really good place to see hobbies. You can get up to 60 birds in the air. Uh, any one time, if you come sort of mid-May, the conditions are right. Uh, using Ham Wall as a kind of motorway service station as they're on their way through on migration, call in, snaffle a load of dragonflies, and then carry on to to wherever they're heading to. A few less stick around locally, um, but yeah, yeah, phenomenal, phenomenal birds to sit and watch. And we've installed some great sky watching seats where you can uh, lay back uh, and get great aerial views of them flying around over your heads. We are we are really keen to um, kind of engage people with nature at Hamwell, um, and because it's such a fantastic site, it's really popular with people wanting to see it. Um, and we now get about sixty to seventy thousand visits a year. Um, we've worked really hard to try and balance the the visitor access and the conservation interest of the reserve, um, providing sort of quite low cost infrastructure that provides a really high quality experience for visitors. Uh, we've also tried some fairly innovative ways to engage new audiences and give people a different view of the wetland. Uh, one of those is our annual canoe safari event, which runs in September each year. Uh, and these events give visitors the opportunity to get out in the water and get a bit and eye view of, of the, uh, the reed bed. Uh, I think when you're, you know, you're still on the edges of it, it looks like just one big mass of reeds. And then when you get out in a canoe, you work out there's lots of creeks, there's lots of ditches and dikes. And it's, it's a very, very different experience. Uh, we've been running these since uh, 2014, um, and we actually redesigned an area of the reed bed in a way that improved the habitat for wildlife, uh, and also gives us an ideal venue to be able to run this event on. Um, it's uh, it's a great great experience. Um, and the thing on the right, uh, this is our new newest addition, and that's a giant bulrush play equipment, um, which is a great hit with the uh, families who come to the reserve. We're getting more and more families out. Uh, onto, onto, onto the ham wall and we're really keen to see them and, and keen to kind of engage them uh, in any way we can. Um, so hopefully that's given you a bit of a taste of ham wall and what it's about. I think I've barely scratched the surface of what goes on at the reserve. Um, obviously I'm biased, but I, I think it's just a great example of how we can take a really impoverished um, kind of ex-industrial landscape uh, and turn it into a great place for wildlife and people in a really short space of time. Uh, thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Steve. That was absolutely fascinating. I love that you were hearing bittern during lockdown when most of us were hearing blackbirds or robins, and you actually heard a bird that was on the edge of extinction in the UK. That is just so cool. Um, we've already got some great questions in the chat, but if anybody's got ones I haven't added yet, please feel free to pop them in and we'll get to them at the end. But thanks so much, Steve. And now to hear from Chris. So Chris has worked at the RSVB for over 20 years now on wetland reserves all throughout the Eastern region. And he finally arrived, he popped down in the East Valley in 2007. 15 years on, Chris works with a team of four wardens and dedicated project managers to create and maintain a seven square kilometer of reserves that all of them take care of. He's really passionate about managing all these reserves and his favorite fauna are all winged. So birds, butterflies, and dragonflies. 
Thanks, Chris. Over to you, your presentation's up. Thanks, Hannah, that's great. So good afternoon, everybody. And uh, yeah, sunny Cambridgeshire uh, too. So yeah, it looks like the sun's out across the country. Um, terrific uh, presentation from Steve there, really, really fantastic. And I, th I think one of the, um, the things I, I feel looking at that is that, that we share a similar story to, to Steve down in Hamwell, uh, but we're, a, we're a, few, a few years behind. So um, I'm looking at some of the birds and wildlife he's, uh, he's got down there with, uh, with, with uh, fascination, wondering when, when some of those are going to arrive with us. And that's starting, starting to happen already. But um, let's get on with a, a flying tour of the, uh, uh, the Great Ouse Valley or our part of it where we manage um, these two fantastic uh, wetland reserves, Fendrain Lakes and Ouse Fen. This is Ouse Fen up on the screen now. Uh, so it's um, a great example of, of what uh, David Attenborough and the Wild Isles team were talking about on Wild Isles on Sunday night. So along with Steve, you know, we're trying to create and restore new freshwater wetlands, which is really absolutely imperative. And uh, between, between us all and the RSPB and other organisations, uh, you know, this is a real sort of big part of conservation in the UK at the moment. So what I'm going to try and do is, is obviously uh, in a similar way to you've heard previously describe uh, why we're here, how these two reserves came to be, uh, give you a little bit of a clue to their future uh, and uh, describe some of the habitats and species uh, that are so special. But uh, like Steve, uh, let's just show you where we are first. Uh, so yeah, we're uh, up in Cambridgeshire on the edge of Peterborough and uh, Lincolnshire. Uh, and you've got the wash for orientation there, uh, up in the, uh, the uh, northeast corner of that map. Uh, and the various, you've got various kind of uh, colored locations there from uh, a variety of uh, neighboring organizations, but I'll point out the RSPB reserve. So we've got ooze washes, uh, this, Long pink, uh, long purple uh, reserve, wet grassland reserve, neen washes uh, a little bit higher up, uh, and uh, here we are. This, this laser pointer may help. Uh, yeah, neen washes, ooze washes, uh, Lake and Heath Fen, and then down here, ooze fen, and uh, not labelled Fendrayton Lakes, just a little bit below. So together, we know these three reserves. Ooze washes, ooze fen, and, and drain lakes is the great ooze wetland. And that's nearly 3,000 hectares of uh, prime freshwater wetlands, uh, stretching 25 miles from the edge of Cambridgeshire all the way up to uh, down and market. So, truly a, a landscape scale wetland nature reserve, uh, and the sort of thing that uh, RSPV and uh, our partner organizations are trying to. Uh, develop in the future. So that is the idea of connecting and linking reserves together. You can see various uh, shaded areas on this reserve, sorry, shaded areas on this map that indicate all sorts of initiatives that are starting to happen across this area and absolutely key to developing uh, habitats and species for uh, our uh, native wildlife. So the other thing that brings us to this part of the Ouse Valley is uh, the decline in habitats. So uh, if we look at this little inset here, uh, that is the scale of the fens in the Middle Ages, nearly 1300 square miles of, of wetland habitat as would have existed at the time of the, the fen tigers. So uh, the fen tigers, not a East Anglian mammal you've never heard of, but the community of people who used to live off the uh, wetland resources of the fens. So they wouldn't recognize those changes in habitat extent that we've seen. Uh, we now, we've, we've lost probably in the order of 97% of that fenland habitat. And you can see on this second inset map that all that remains is just those few tiny fragments uh, and if you were to head over to Lake Neath Fen, you'd see a single tile on the floor in their reception, which represents that 3%, 3% uh, 
of that original wetland habitat that remains. So as well as the biodiversity and climate crisis, the loss of habitat, the loss of species, uh, we know that uh, there are a great many other things that sort of brought new nature reserves to this area. Uh, and extraordinarily, in some respects, the thing that's brought us here is the glaciers. So strange as that may, may sound, the reason that glaciers have brought us here is, is the impact they had on the landscape. Uh, those glaciers washed sands and gravels across the landscape. They gathered in river terraces on the edges of the floodplain, and that's brought the minerals industry to this part of the world. So in the same way that Steve's reserve was based on uh, or came about through the, the peat industry, our, our reserves have come about through the actions of the, uh, the minerals industry, and we've worked with them in contrasting ways across Oost Fen and Fendrayton Lakes. Uh, at Fendrayton, this is, this is Fendrayton here, in many ways it looks like a natural landscape, but in reality, uh, these are ex-quarry lakes. Parts of them have been restored to nature, but the large majority uh, are really kind of unplanned in many ways. We'll come back to Oost Fen shortly, but Oost Fen is a, a completely contrasting nature reserve. It came about through very detailed and, and highly planned conservation action. So we'll come back to that. But the story of all these wetland nature reserves in this part of the country, uh, or at least the two that we're, we're managing here, is, is a story of almost from gravel to grebes. So we're bringing back key species through, through this partnership work with uh, some of our mineral partner organizations. So in Fendrayton's case, uh, as I said, this is a the sort of more unplanned version of the two reserves we're looking for. And it was came back through quarrying through the 1950s to the 1990s. But together the two reserves that we're managing here cover about seven square kilometers. But when they're complete, we think they'll probably cover over 10 square kilometers. So it's a vast area. But they are both very young reserves. Uh, we arrived on the ground in about 2007. So this really is a kind of, uh, compared to some of our kind of uh, long lived and ancient habitats, these are very, very, uh, very, very young sites and still, still growing and uh, still developing. So to give you a sense of the, the habitats at Fendrayton, uh, they're dominated by uh, open water, uh, areas of riverside meadows, small patches of reed bed. Some of the meadows are grazed, some of them are hay cut. And of course, uh, as you'd imagine for these sort of ex-quarry lakes, they're surrounded by fringes of scrub and thin woodland, uh, hedgerows in places. But Fendrayton is divided into two halves really, an area dominated by the lakes and then a, uh, a section we, we know as Middle Fen that is, is predominantly riverside meadows. But the total is about 390 hectares. And these are all freshwater habitats that have probably only existed in their current form for uh, perhaps 50, 60, 70 years, not very long in many ways. So, the site is largely undesignated. It's, there's a lot of freedom for us to, uh, to shape and change things at Fendrayton, uh, but it has some unique characteristics. It's uh, highly influenced by patterns of flooding. So uh, at the moment, as we speak, there's a, a small flood in the River Ouse uh, and parts of the reserve are very, very wet indeed. Uh, and that sort of, um, is reflected in the fact that we're also a flood storage reservoir uh, and have responsibilities and uh, uh, yeah, serious responsibilities to, to sort of maintain the site as a sort of a flood storage facility uh, and protect sort of communities nearby. So uh, that's a, a constraint that we have to work with at all times. So um, what do all these habitats bring? Uh, what are our key species? So I'll put together a little montage here of some of our, uh, some of our kind of uh, sometime birds, 
uh, this is, is the sort of wildlife that you might expect to see on a typical quarry uh, lake complex. So resident wildfowl, swans, uh, some of the rarer ducks and like shoveler, gadwall, potchard. Uh, but um, we're also talking about birds like grebes, common waterside birds, kingfisher a possibility. And uh, like you've seen in, in great numbers on Ham Wall, a uh, good chance of coming across uh, some of our egret species, resident egret species. Like Steve, we have uh, great cattle and, of course, little egrets here. Uh, glossy ibises have shown up in recent years, uh, but then on our islands uh, and rafts that we um, have placed around the, the lakes, we have populations of common terns, uh, up to 30 or 40 pairs each year, joined by noisy black headed gulls in much greater numbers in the hundreds. Uh, and then on some of our islands, we have uh, breeding waders uh, occupying the scattered scrapes as well. And this includes birds like lapwing, oyster catcher, red shank and avocet. Uh, but the, the site is also known as a very notable one for dragonflies, not quite the abundance that we saw um, on Wild Isles and, and uh, Steve slides, but uh, uh, we have 22 species. Uh, most recent colonists include willow emerald, dragonfly, uh, Norfolk hawker, uh, and of course the four spot in uh, great numbers uh, shown here in the image. Uh, one of the unusual features of, of Fendrayton um, is that we are known as a sort of really good site for turtle dove. Uh, and we've sort of recently acquired up to five pairs, which uh, puts us in the position of being sort of the most kind of populous RSPB reserve for, for turtle doves, which uh, given the sort of precipitous to sort of decline in turtle doves, we know sort of 90%, 97% losses in the past 20 years is going to be a real challenge to maintain, uh, which is why we need to return turtle doves back to the, to the wider countryside if we can. But the reserve uh, remains one of the top birding watching sites, uh, bird watching sites in Cambridgeshire, uh, with over 200 species recorded. Um, otter and water vole are also a possibility, uh, and we have some rare, rare plants uh, such as grass poly, which occupies some of the sort of wetland fringes too. So, uh, lots of things to draw people here. Uh, so that's a very quick um, description of some of the habitats and, and species at. Uh, at Fendrayton Lakes, but I want to take you on a quick foray into a different direction because there's another story at, at Fendrayton, which uh, is is sort of arguably sort of why the reserve was was acquired in the in the first place, and that's one about sort of trying to develop it as a, a visitor site. So we know from Wild Isles that uh, we need to switch people onto wildlife. Um, part of the RSPB's mission is to, sh to share wildlife with people, transform that wonder, uh, the care that they have for the natural world and direct it into sort of support and action. So it's really important that we engage with many more people. Uh, and we're on a similar journey to the one C Steve described in trying to kind of uh, switch people on, connect them with the natural world uh, and bring them to the reserve. The big bonus we have at Fendrayton is that we are so close to some of the big local catchments. Uh, there's 128,000 households within 12 miles of the reserve, so a huge catchment. And the reserve could provide a gateway to the 25 miles of wetland that we uh, saw previously in that sort of location shot. So the reserve was acquired with this kind of purpose in mind. So we're really very keen to kind of develop it. Uh, and uh, share it with a lot more people. So uh, as well as that, that kind of visitor work, I mean, we're obviously all the time working on habitat improvements and we have created scrapes, new reed beds, uh, opened up wetland habitats and enhanced islands, but we're really most keen to try and develop um, the facilities for, to draw in a, a bigger numbers of people and we could we could get up to sort of similar figures to the, to the ones that Steve's described, perhaps up to 75,000 visitors from the 20 to 30,000 that we get each year. But we do need to do that in partnership with the local community and stakeholders. Uh, and we're working towards innovative, innovative ways of, 
of engaging with more visitors. Uh, some of those you've, you've seen in Steve's slides, but uh, new initiatives that we're going to give a go include things like wild camping, or what we call nearly wild camping, uh, de developments that involve kind of green gym opportunities. So what's sometimes known as nature's cure, or giving people opportunity to exercise uh, and address mental health issues in the countryside. Uh, but we hope that's the start of a, of a journey that will switch them on, connect them with nature. Uh, and we've tried to do that by illustrating with a vision. This is a sort of a, a before view of the reserve, uh, quiet enjoyment on riverside habitats, connecting people with nature in the great outdoors. We know the reserve is already a, an oasis for people on the edge of greater Cambridge, uh, but we want them to come here, discover and enjoy wildlife and spectacles on offer. Uh, but one of the features of the reserve that cuts through the middle, you can see that uh, track. There's a cyclist just running, uh, cycling along the edge of that track, but that is a Sustrans route. It's also a, a, uh, a dedicated guided busway and Fendrayton has its own uh, bus stop. So this is what the reserve could look like in uh, five or 10 years time. We still want to hold on to all of that wildlife protect the peace and tranquility, but create a new visitor hub from which people can explore the whole length of the valley. Uh, so that in will include improved facilities, uh, such things as nature-based play for children, better trails, wildlife viewing, uh, and just a host of opportunities for people to sort of engage with nature, get active uh, and take part. So we'll probably develop that in phases, uh, and uh, all the time making sure that we're consulting local people, bringing them along with us and uh, just making it a great place to be. So that's a, a quick spin around Fendrayton. Uh, I want to take you further down the valley, down to use Fen next. Uh, it's another mineral site, but is very different into, into uh, very different in relation to Fendrayton. Uh, use Fen was planned many, many years ago, starting in the late 90s. Uh, it's a, uh, a freshwater again, freshwater wetland again, designed as a reed bed. And you can see from the scale of this plan that it's a huge project. It's nearly a thousand football pitches in size. That's a 700 hectare uh, wetland that you're looking at, which sits between five of the surrounding villages and has a long history lots of RSPB uh, input from a vast number of uh, staff, colleagues and partners to get this off the ground. And it's a phased construction where we're working in partnership with the minerals industry, uh, working particularly with Hanson UK in a project called the Hanson RSPB Wetland Project. Uh, and you can see from this original vision, which was uh, painted for us by Bruce Pearson, the kind of uh, outlook, the kind of vision that we were trying to create. Uh, and much like um, the project you saw in the first half of this presentation from Steve, we set out with, with trying to attract that big three, as we call them, the big three rebed species, bitterns, marsh areas, and bearded tits. So that was the driver, uh, much, much as a, a ham wall, to create this amazing uh, landscape scale wetland nature reserve. Um, I have to say, we've had some fantastic results and we'll look at those shortly, but swallowtail, which is in the bottom right hand corner of that photo is not something we've managed to bring back, not yet. So there's a huge amount of work goes into creating this reserve. It's highly complex. Uh, instead of working with, with peat, we're working with sands and gravels uh, and iterative and detailed designs um, go into achieving this, land, this landform. All aimed at creating the, the landform that we need. That landform will go, goes on to create uh, the various habitat types we're looking for. Water management is incredibly important. Uh, the way we move soils around the site receives a lot of attention. 
you can see the scale of the project from this image. And it's a rolling restoration, like you saw at Ham Wall. We work in individual cells so that the reserve can uh, take off as soon as possible. Uh, we create individual mirrors, so it's not one single wetland. Each individual mirror gives us unique control. The little insect that you can see in this photo shows some archaeological excavations that go on before the site even starts. Uh, they spread from the Mesolithic to the Bronze Age. Tens of thousands of finds have been found. Um, yeah, a presentation all on its own, but the really fantastic story that we've um, that arises from all that work is is the one of bringing back uh, many of the uh, bird species that used to exist on this site and have been shown in the archaeological evidence. So they found bones from not only bitten and all the common waterside birds that we've looked at today, but species including Dalmatian pelican, extraordinarily. Uh, and also white-tailed eagle. So not only are we bringing back all of those reed bed birds to a site that must have had them in centuries past, but we're, we're also showing evidence of species that uh, could form part, part of new introductions in future to this part of the world. So absolutely fascinating kind of archeological background, but what does that all go to achieve? Um, key for us is creating lots and lots of edge, uh, we know from bitten research that uh, bittens occupy uh, much of their, their uh, daily, daily lives 30 metres from the edge of water. So we've tried to create as much edge as we can. And the end result is a high quality, is a high quality uh, optimal reed bed in our minds. Uh, lots of ecological input from RSPB experts. And obviously... Uh, a highly complex water management system, but it does rely on uh, reed planting. Steve described some of their experiences down at Hamwall. We have very similar, uh, had a very similar history, lots and lots of reed planting, 130,000 reeds have been planted in total at Uspen. Uh, but now nature and natural regeneration has largely taken over. So in terms of the wildlife, um, we're, we're living in um, the sort of shadow of, of projects like, like Hamwall. We're some 10 years behind Steve. So many of the, the species that he's described, uh, we have in slightly smaller numbers. Uh, we probably described birds like uh, reed warbler, sedge warbler and, and reed bunting as really being sort of too high numbers to count these days. Uh, but you can find chetties, grasshopper warblers here. Uh, we have cormorants and egret colonies occupying some of the scrubby islands, but uh, perhaps the, the key thing is to, is to uh, focus on what's happened to our three key species that we described earlier. So like Steve, we have a picture of a flock of bittens, uh, almost the same number, but uh, not, uh, not in quite the same uh, colonies as, as uh, they've experienced at Hamwall so far here. Our peak bitten count is uh, 12 booming birds uh, in 2021. Uh, but as uh, we've heard earlier, that is a remarkable, a remarkable total uh, and a testament to projects like this, uh, like Hamwall and like the uh, series of wetland initiatives that have gone across the country uh, in recent years and, and created this, this revival in fortune of birds like Bitten from that sort of nadir of 11 males in 1997 to the over 200 that we heard about early on. So um, uh, I'm just going to push on fairly quickly through to the end just to give, uh, give us time for a few um, questions, but uh, obviously to point out that water, uh, sorry, that marsh harriers uh, do well here, uh, six nests and the Bearded tits uh, are probably too numerous to count, much like our reed warblers and sedge, sedge warblers. So I'm just going to leave you at the end here with a, a quick video, which sums up the um, our experiences, shows you where we are so far. 
Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you all for coming along uh, today. And uh, I'll rejoin you shortly for uh, some questions. But I'll show you this video, which I think captures the essence of uh, Usven. And uh, yeah, see you in a bit. Yeah, thank you, Chris. That was an absolutely brilliant video. Um, and the whole presentation is so interesting. You think you're doing almost this paleontology on birds in the area. And hopefully it's it's really astounding to think of the amount of work that has to go back into making the land suitable for them once again. But thinking of white-tailed eagles and Dalmatian pelicans coming over south of England would be fantastic. Um, so we've already got some great questions in there. If anybody's got any that come to mind, please do pop them in the chat. If you can put whether they're for Chris or Steve, that would be fantastic. We are running just a little bit late. So um, I understand if you all, anybody needs to head off at two o'clock, but all the questions and answers we can answer afterwards. And there'll be a recording on the YouTube channel. So you'll be able to check up on them after. So I can just start going through some of the questions that came in. Um, first one for Steve, does each male bittern have a different boom and how do you count them? Um, that one's okay. from Karen. Thanks, I'll, Karen. I'll answer that one in reverse, Karen. Um, so how, how do we count them? Uh, we have a big um, partnership or a couple of partnership events each year called the Bitten Booming Count, imaginatively. Uh, we get volunteers out for all of the organisations and we do a coordinated count across the whole area. Um, and then from people's records, we can kind of triangulate to work out how many how many male birds are there. Um, you can identify individual birds according to the booms, and people have done you know quite advanced kind of sound recording and analysis to prove that. Um, but also, if you spend a bit of time on site, I'm fairly sure you can work out where the really strong booming birds are and where the really wheezy ones are, and ones that boom a lot, ones that boom, don't boom a lot. Um, and yeah, you can you can get to know individuals almost on your site. Love that. So you can tell the kind of old, slightly decrepit bitterns. <laughs> they got a bit of a creaky moan. Um, so just one for Chris. Um, are you noticing sea level rise and how are you preparing for this at either site? That's from Claire. Um, we we don't we don't see sea level rise impacting directly on the reserve here. We're just above <laughs> the tidal influence. Um, I suppose it's probably fair to say we probably do more preparation for climate change in other ways. So we've tried to future proof our, our water supplies. So we've allowed for climate change scenarios in the way in which we calculate our water budget. 
So that's the amount of water we need to bring onto the reserve. Uh, so that's probably the key way in which we've addressed sort of um, yeah climate change issues and uh, the impact on the the, the um, yeah freshwater environment and, and and the water that comes onto the reserve. Great, right, thanks, Chris. Uh, one just for Steve from Doug. How significant are frogs and other amphibians as food for the heron species? Uh, that's a really good question, Doug. Um, so. Uh, Around Ham Wall, the Avalon Marshes, there's, there's, uh, we get something called the Iberian water frog or Perez's frog, which is an introduced species. Um, it used to be known as the marsh frog, and then it got um, DNA tested by some guys from amphibian and reptile conservation, and they came down, got a frog, made it open its mouth and swabbed it with a cotton bird, a bit like CSI. And it turned out to be this other species of frog. And that may well be playing quite a big part with the new colonizing species and providing a lot of food for them um the, the frogs over winter as tadpoles you can get really huge tadpoles <laughs> so there's probably a lot of biomass out there from from that, those frog species um and that's that's probably playing a part certainly it's kind of managing the habitat for all this down the food chain isn't it rather than it's one particular species it's brilliant um chris one for you from gareth will you have an environmental education center for outdoor learning at the reserves um that's a really good question. At the at the moment, that's not not in the current kind of um, in the current plans. But I I, I, th I think it, I think we're really early on in this process, um, uh, and it's sort of yeah we're, we're we're working out what the content of all these features might be um, as we go. So I say I would say perhaps I wouldn't rule it in and I wouldn't rule it out. Yeah, I imagine there's a lot of feedback going on with people in the area and everything. So it'd be great to see how it all pans out. Yeah. Um, one back over to Steve um, from Liz. Why do reed beds need so much management? Uh, okay, so Ham Wall, we, we manage for a whole variety of reasons. Um, one is that over time they, they dry out and they kind of turn into Carl Woodland and Carl Woodland's lovely, but uh, we want to try and keep Ham Wall as, as a relatively wet reed bed. Um, so we cut and remove to, to get rid of litter layer and um, and, and kind of stop them drying out that way. We also cut to provide um, a kind of age structure. So some things like older bits of reed, some bits like younger bits of reed um, and everything in between. Um, and the third reason is we, we want to make the site more dynamic at Hamwall. So we want to have it constantly changing. Um, so we take sections of the reed bed and we'll dry them out for four or five years, cut the whole lot of reed, flood it, do all sorts of things to, to kind of really, uh, really make it very dynamic and constantly changing. And a lot of the species seem to be really benefiting from that. So that, yeah, there's a whole variety of reasons we, we, we manage at Hamwell. Amazing, thanks. Um, back over to Chris, this question from Doug. Where do the Fendrate and turtle doves feed? Sounds like he's quite keen to see them. <laughs> hi, hi, Doug, how are you doing? Um, uh, yes, yeah, a good question, Doug. Um, uh, they're, they, I think they're using some of the, the the paths and tracks. Obviously, it's the bear. We know, uh, as you as you well know, it, it's the bear areas um, that they're making use of. Uh, and you know, we have some low uh, fertility grassland uh, in the centre of the site that we know there's at least one pair using. Um, and obviously, there's an association between turtle dove and uh, wetland sites, as you know from your time at Falmere. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's surprising. I think it surprised many of us that, that Fendrayton's proved quite as attractive as it's been. Um, uh, that that figure I mentioned, I think, of five pairs is quite exceptional. I mean, I know you had quite a few at Falmere in the past, um, but uh, it, it's a, it's quite a high figure. But I think we're um, we're conscious that we really need to get them back out into the wider countryside because it is a it's a wider countryside species that should be out there. Uh, and I think if we're entirely reliant on on you know fragments of reserves that are remaining that for that species, that yeah, we need to do more elsewhere. Really, I think everyone was taking notes while you answered that one. There'll be a bit of a rush of spring. Um, I think this one was for Steve um, from Christopher. Do great white egrets need different conditions to bitterns? Um, yeah, I think we're still learning as we go with that stuff, but. Um... Certainly in terms of where they breed, um, they seem to nest in very different places. So reed um, bittens are generally in the kind of denser, bigger blocks of reed bed. Um, great white egrets, I always thought quite confusingly, seem to choose the spindliest, thinnest bits of reed they can find. 
and then build a nest that's a couple of meters above the water, which makes no sense to me, but obviously they know what they're doing. Um, so yeah, in terms of nesting habitat, in terms of feeding, um, as Chris was saying, they don't, bittens tend not to spread, go too far from that kind of reed edge kind of zone, whereas great white egrets are much more, um, much more able to, more, more adaptable um, and uh, are going all over the place to feed, really. It's tricky to manage for both really, isn't it? Um, this is one for Chris and not to put you on the spot to give the official RSVP mm -hmm. line or anything, but just mm -hmm. to hear your thoughts. Um, here's a question from Gareth. Anglian Water are proposing a new Fens Reservoir. What are the RSPB views and the potential impact on your local reserves? Uh, yeah, I think, um, I mean, we have we have our conservation officers involved, which is a thing, yeah, you know, how we, we would um, we'd expect to sort of manage that relationship with Anglian Water. So we've been involved for quite a long time and been involved in the consultation. Uh, I think our approach is is probably one of trying to uh, make sure that we just get the best the best outcomes for wildlife. Um, and I think, as I understand it, I'm not intimately involved in the project. There will be there will be um, dedicated mitigation work for wildlife, and that will be part of the um, uh, part of the, the design of the, the facility. Um, uh, but the impact on our own reserves, I don't think is going to be great. Um, it's fairly remote, as I understand it. Um, so it's it's one of those things uh, where we're effectively trying to make the uh, you know get the best outcome for wildlife we can from something that will that will happen. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris, to throw you a curveball there. Um, there's also a question from Bill. Um, did I see a beaver in the photos from Ooze Fen? Uh, uh, no. <laughs> Unfortunately not, no. Um, yeah, I think that was a, a, a rather a victim of my uh, having to speed up a little bit towards the end just to um, draw things to a conclusion. But I didn't talk about um, uh, species like otter and water vole that you can see at, at both reserves. That was a water vole, I think, in that image. Uh, and they are kind of expanding across the Fen as, as the site grows. Uh, but um, yeah, beavers is a nice idea. And I'm sure they're coming coming our way and many wetland uh, and to many wetland reserves around the, across the country, whether we like it or not, probably. But no, no plans, no plans at the moment. <laughs> so we have to wait a little while longer to see a yeah. beaver wandering around Cambridgeshire. Um, this is one more question from Tom asking if there's a comprehensive list of all the RSVP reserves that have been featured on Wild Isles. And I might be able to answer that one um, in that if we haven't been able to reveal all of the reserves in advance of the episodes going out, and there's this one more coming up this Sunday on Oceans. So after that, we'll be able to um, reveal more of the listings of our reserves. Um, but our country teams have been putting out some great blogs and content around each of them. So if you have a look on our website, they'll often say where you can see the species that were featured and noting where ones that have already come up have been featured. Amazing. Um, oh, one final question has come in from Roy. Um, I think this is one for you, Chris. Are there cranes on either reserve? And why was the bitten flying upside down? <laughs> um, uh, we, do we do have cranes at Oosman. Uh, so uh, we had a pair for a number of years. Um, they've not been successful, unfortunately, so far. Um, but uh, yeah. They're, they're, they're sort of fairly regular with this. Um, I'm not sure about the bitten flying upside down. I think there was, I think in both Steve's shot of his bitten flock and, and, and our, our image, there's some bittens adopting some quite um, odd postures. And we think, you know, I, I think the, the, the theory is that they're effectively chasing females. Those are males chasing females in, in, in sort of courtship. So they're pulling some pretty kind of strange poses, but I'm not sure they're quite flying upside down, but there was some pretty, yeah, some pretty strange, strange postures going on. <laughs> and Roy's actually followed up saying the pitten was one one of Steve's fixes. Sorry, I loved that the wrong the wrong person. Yeah, um, I, I, I think it, I think it was a there was a bill. I don't know, Steve. You perhaps you could say, but there was a bill that seemed to almost did give it the impression of flying upside down. But though I'm not sure if it was or not. Yeah, I, I don't think it was upside no. down. But you're right; they do pull some really strange shapes when they're doing that behaviour. Um, I think the record in the other marshes is twelve bittens in the air at one time. Wow. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. That's impressive. And that seems to be the last of our questions. So thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. I feel like I've learned loads um, 
much more informative lunch than, than I normally have. As mentioned earlier, a short survey will be popping up on your screens once we close the webinar, and we'd love to hear your feedback if you do have time to just let us know what you think. Thanks to everyone watching and to Steve and Chris for your fantastic talks and videos. They were absolutely wonderful. We have just one webinar left in our Wild Isles series. On the 13th of April, we'll be hearing from Laura Bambini and Zoe Deacon on their work with Manx Shear Water and Storm Petrels, which are just the most wonderful seabirds. So definitely encourage you to come along to that one as well. And the link to register for that webinar will be included in the survey. So thank you, everyone. And I hope you have a lovely rest of the day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.